opportunity to welcome this call is now being recorded to welcome today's chief guest mr sandeep choudhary he is working as a head of business in cotton limited pune i welcome the resource person of the workshop and today's speaker dr sudeep ingole he is from houston texas usa i welcome our vice principal professor nb de our head of the department dr shewale dr mogal all my colleagues all the participants from various institute and my dear students biology is the science of friction wear and lubrication but tribology is very important in today's world because so much energy is lost in friction in that mechanical engine component so it is necessary to reduce that friction and eliminate wear so we can enhance the life of that component so keeping all these points in mind the department of mechanical engineering is organize two days online workshop on the recent trends in industrial tribology so on this occasion i request head of the department dr shewale to give welcome speech over to you sir shewale sir uh, thank you kakri sir uh, good morning to all on behalf of mechanical engineering department i welcome chief guest today's inaugural function of two day online workshop on recent trends in industrial tribology mr sandeep choudhary grews cotton limited pune i welcome today's speaker mr sudeep ingole i also welcome respected principal nns patil sir respected vice principal professor nb desle sir coordinator of this two day workshop faculty members of mechanical department and participants as we know the tribology science and engineering of interacting surface in relative motion it includes the study and application of principles of friction lubrication and wear so tribology there are many applications traditional applications and in addition to traditional applications there are many devices and other products that we can regularly use in our daily life which rely on tribology they include products and process that arise in healthcare sports nature and more if you see in energy conservation energy saving point of view then it is very important to reduce the energy loss by using the updated tribological concept hence it is important to study the recent trends in tribology so in this two day workshop we have three eminent speaker to share their knowledge in the field of tribology mr sudeep ingole who is going to share his views on development of self lubricating material mr hemant pari who is going to share his views on industrial oil condition monitoring and dr y r khade who is going to share his views on tribology of composite material so i hope these sessions will be very benefited to all the participants who are working in the field of tribology so once again i welcome you all for this two day workshop on behalf of mechanical engineering thank you thank you sir so now i request our vice principal professor nb desle to enlighten us on this occasion over to you sir desle sir thank you dr kakade sir who is the coordinator of this two days workshop recent trends in industrial tribology on the behalf of maratha vidya prasarak samajas kbt college of engineering i take this opportunity to welcome 
today's chief guest, Sandeep Saudhri sir, as well as Sudeep Ingle sir. And I owe my thanks by heart to them for remaining present for this inaugural function and delivering their valuable information, sharing it with all the participants. I can see nearly 150 participants today. Dear sir, I take this opportunity to tell you something about this great educational institute, Maratha Vidya Prasarak Samaj, which is nearly 106 years old now. And ours is a college which has been started in 1999. And is starving for the best practices and making all efforts from the bottom of the heart to make aware and to get acquainted with all the recent developments that are happening in the field of education, basically engineering for this college. Bahujan Hita and Bahujan Sukha is the motto of our institute, sir. And hence, during this COVID situation, our medical college staff as well as engineering staff is also contributing to help our society to overcome this very drastic challenge that had been thrown by Mother Nature, but due to the mistakes of human being. The best example is the medical college where our principal and education officer, Dr. Anish Patni sir, is also working 24 by 7 hours along with the team of MVP. It is an engineering approach basically which always tries to find out the continuous and improved solutions for all the problems. And our Department of Mechanical Engineering is also contributing a lot in this regard. This workshop is an example or the one of the best example in order to show that we are not going to be defeated by the situations. So hence online workshops, seminars, webinars are continuously arranged by this department. And hence I extend my best wishes to this department of mechanical engineering. I congratulate head of that department, Dr. Vinod Shevai sir, coordinator, Dr. Kakle sir, all his team. And I'm sure that these two days workshop will give some rays of hopes in the field of industrial typology. So I thank the Department of Mechanical Engineering for inviting me and allowing me to share this view with all these participants. So thank you and I hand over the mic to proceedings to Dr. Takadesan. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your information and guidance and motivation. Now, it's my privilege to introduce today's chief guest and eminent personality, Mr. Sandeep Chaudhary. Mr. Sandeep Chaudhary is currently working as head of business in Greaves Cotton Limited, Pune. He has done his post-graduation in mechanical engineering. He is having a experience of 15 years in Mahindra and Mahindra Limited, Nasik. He is having total experience of 25 years in research and development of IC engines. On his credits is the launch of world's first single cylinder electronic diesel engine meeting BS6 emission for three-wheeler. He has launched various IC engines for three-wheeler, four-wheeler and truck. Sir is a core member of India's four-cylinder engine for a four-wheeler for SUV application. Sir has published various research paper on SAE on automotive engine research work. So on behalf of mechanical engineering department of MVP's KBT College of Engineering Nasi, I welcome you, sir. And I request you to guide us. Over to you, sir. Saudari, sir. Sandeep, sir. Thank you very much, Kakade, uh, sir, and Patil, sir. Uh, first of all, I hope you all are doing well in this current COVID situation and taking care of your and your family's health. Uh, 
again thank you for uh, inviting me for this two days workshop uh, i had a long association with ndmp in direct indirect way so when in when this uh, institute started in 1999 one of my senior uh, professor gorke he joined in ndmp so i know this institute very well and i think in 2009 10 i used to visit this uh, college as a external speaker or for why was uh, i had i used to uh, meet mr kakade then uh, choudhary sir was there so i know this uh, institute very well because i was in nasik in mahindra for more than 15 years till 2010 so this institute has come up very well in nasik uh, particularly that i'll say north maharashtra zone and it is very well uh, reputed and well respected organization when it comes to education field so again thank you and i wish all the best uh, to enter institute to keep the same momentum which they have uh, kept in last 21 years now uh, coming to today's topic uh, before i move to this uh, i think two days workshop related things uh, i would like to just ha i have a couple of slides i'll just see whether i am able to uh, present it i'll just try it whether i can present it hmm? just give me one second is it visible my screen is visible no sir not yet yes sir yes sir now yes sir okay so i think the now it is visible okay this is your uh, two days workshop to topic tribology recent trends in industry since i have been working with automotive industry from last 25 years so i know the importance of this tribology because particularly in ic engines in automotive industry this is very important topic uh, which is going through a lot of research and new development so uh, before moving to actual that the workshop related topic i just want to share some of the points which uh, personally i have noticed in last 6 months right now we are working from home you all know that this covid 19 has impact on human health as well as global economy and india is not the option for that india is also suffering from this and since i am from automotive industry i just want to share that in in india particularly automotive industry shares uh, contribute 7.1% of gdp what are gdp we have out of that 7% contribution comes from automotive industry and in manufacturing gdp 49% is contributed from automotive industry this industry gives the employment to 37 million people more close to 3.7 crore and in this current situation i think first time in the history uh, the uh, first quarter sales that was from april 2020 to june 2020 uh, it has been declined by 75% it was mainly because of lockdown which was uh, declared by government so particularly in the month of april there was no production and sale so it was a 100% april was the first month i think in the history wherein there was no production in automotive industry and sell so in first 3 months it has been declined by 75% remaining 25% was mainly related to agriculture sector wherein still people were purchasing the tractors or other equipments but overall uh, automotive industry is down and looking at current situation and the way it is uh, slowly slowly improving uh, i Uh, this is cm data that means society of automotive industry and also published by uh, department of ministry uh, in next 2 to 3 year 2 years uh, still there will be degrowth to 30 to 35% compared to last 2 years so it will take at least 2 to 3 years to improve the overall situation and come back to the original position so it has huge impact on economy as well as the employment 
and so since uh, this is the main industry which contributes uh, close to 50% of manufacturing government is and this is not the only industry which is suffering uh, there are all other industry whether it is hospitality or tourism all industries are suffering so government is planning uh, coming up with some key drivers for economy recovery so affordability is one of the initiative they are going to take it when i say affordability means it is they are going to uh, revisit all the costs so how to make the products cheap so in that process they are going to announce some uh, reduction in taxes gst or uh, other things so that will reduce the cost so affordability improvement that is one of the key driver to boost the economy second thing is right now rural market revival that is second thing government is looking at uh because of current situation now banks are not giving any loan um, to people for any start up business or anything so finance availability is the third uh driver government is looking at then uh revival of e-commerce and service industry is the fourth and then uh the last one is very important particularly in india the tourism and hospitality sector uh, hotels everything it was almost closed for more than six months so the revival of that industry sector is because that is also one of the major contributor for indian economy gdp so all not only these five but there are other uh, factors also which government is working on it and in next three months they are going to launch different schemes to boost the economy so this is the overall impact of covid on indian economy and different sectors now coming to this topic of tribology we all know that there are a lot of challenges and trends though i am not expert of this uh, particular subject but since i am working with automotive industry so this is one of the factor we do consider uh, in development or design of all the engines or power trends whatever is moving basically there this it plays a lot of role and i know there are subject experts are available today and tomorrow to give more details about this the way uh, this manufacturing industry there are evolutions it started from industry zero now today industry four is there same way there are a lot of evolutions in tribology people are working on uh, research and development of course uh, when uh, people work on research and development huge investments are required while doing the research so that is one of the major concern in this particularly uh, tribology field and you all know that now there are temperatures are increasing whether it is engines or whether it is environmental temperatures or machines temperature because they all want higher efficiency so in order to become a more efficient product so operating temperatures are increasing it is leading to shear stress so this is one of the challenge for this lubricants and fuels to cope up uh, second one is at uh, increased demand on fuel life so any uh, lubricant or any fluid we are using uh, whether it is in manufacturing or automotive or any industry uh, today the customer requirement is basically the uh, longer drain interval so that it should uh, sustain for longer life so this is one of the challenge this industry is facing then again in order to improve the fuel economy co2 reduction e- efficiency improvement friction reduction is again one more challenge this industry uh, has to overcome and again while doing this they are putting efforts but huge expenses are required in r&d and since i worked in engineering for last 25 years i know is the success rate of research and the capital expenses required for any research in terms of trends there are more than 10 to 12 trends in particularly tribology but key points if i have to highlight i think that is extended drain interval whether it is oil change or any fuel filter change anything if you see uh, the change interval expectations are more than double now equipments wherein this tribal uh, lubricants or fuels are used the designs are continuously changing uh, for higher efficiencies and higher temperatures and higher stresses 
so that is also leading to requirement of change in uh, this fuels and lubricants new surface treatments are getting used uh, there is a competition there is uh, earlier there were conventional ic engines were used for vehicles now there are electric vehicles and alternate fuel vehicles are coming so the role of uh, this lubricants and fuels is getting reduced so they have to be competitive enough in this alternate fuel vehicle segment uh, so a lot of research is required and it is going on and of course there are a lot of tighter environmental regulations whether it is safety related whether it is pollution related a lot of regulations are coming india is matching to global norms so with all these uh, challenges and trends this industry is working on various uh, research innovation and uh, so far they are able to fulfill all the requirement what uh, industry was requesting from on uh, these fuels and lubricants so uh, this is the limited uh, information i i had from last my uh, experience of course there are subject experts in industry also even in our r&d also we have a special uh, oil and fuel lab wherein this all research work goes on so this is a very interesting subject actually earlier people used to work on uh, give the priority to mechanical field mechanical field then electronics came into picture it came into picture and then all focus was there but now uh, looking at the continuous demand of customer even this particularly tribology field also is going through a lot of evolution and it is a very interesting topic or subject to understand and i think i hope uh, whatever guest lectures we have for the next two days uh, they will take you through all the details about this field and uh, i wish all the best and success to all participants uh, lecture uh, guest speakers and also request to take care uh, for current covid thank you thank you very much sir for this your very nice information and guidance so now i request dr mogal he is also coordinator of this workshop along with me to present vote of thanks over to you sir mogal sir thank you sir on behalf of department of mechanical engineering of mvp samajas ebt college of engineering nasik i take this opportunity to thank our today's chief guest mr sandeep choudhary sir for accepting our request and sharing his valuable knowledge i also thank today's speaker dr sudeep ingole sir from texas usa i thank to management of mvp samaj our principal and education officer dr ns patil sir vice principal professor nb resle sir our head of department dr vc shewale sir for their valuable guidance and support i thank to professor dedi kulkarni sir for technical support last but not least i thank to all our participants present for the inaugural function thank you over to you kakade sir okay thank you sir now i request professor sy pawar to handle further proceedings professor pawar yes good morning to all hello uh, yes, uh, now i i request sir audible yes i i request dr sudeep ingole sir to start his proceeding hello mm, introduction de to mi tanto te tan antar sir you first yes sir yes okay sir so now we are going to proceed for the first session of this workshop the title of the first session is that is development of self lubricating materials so it is a great honor to me to introduce today's speaker and resource person of the workshop dr sudeep ingole dr sudeep ingole 
completed his undergraduate in metallurgy from National Institute of Technology, NIT Nagpur, Master of Engineering in Manufacturing Engineering from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He holds the PhD from University of Alaska in Mechanical Engineering. He worked in industry and taught engineering courses at Texas A&M University. He regularly gives guest lectures at universities and advises students for their research projects. He is a self-employed and resident in Houston, Texas. He is the owner of Presenjit Technologies, Houston, Texas, USA. He works in engineering, contract research, innovation and technology development, especially in materials and mechanical engineering. He has several international patents published in United States of America, Canada and Europe. He regularly serves as reviewer for the various international journals and also he has published various research papers in various international journals. So, I welcome you, sir. Now, I request Dr. Sudip Ingole to proceed with the presentation. Over to you, sir, Ingole, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kakade. Uh, can you hear me clear? Yes, sir. Your voice is audible. Clear. Yes, sir. Let me share yes, my sir. screen. Please do let me know if you can see the screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Yes, yes, sir. It is visible. Sir. And you can hear me too, right? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. All right. uh, good morning to you all. Uh, thank good you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Uh, tribology is very close to my heart, and I'm, I'm always excited to talk about it. Uh, let me thank. Uh, Professors Patil, Desale, Shevle, Professor Kakre, Mongol, and uh, Professor Pawar for organizing this uh, very uh, interesting uh, workshop and very useful as, as a matter of fact. And I will also uh, thank uh, Mr. Sandeep Choudhury for uh, the insight that uh, he uh, gave about the current trends in the industry and it is really a challenging time not just for india but uh, you know entire world and even through that we we need to survive right so we need to uh, you know uh, uh, stay tight and uh, fight with all our uh, capabilities with that let me uh, come back to the presentation i'm going to talk about the self lubricating materials and I was told that the majority of uh, participants of this uh, workshop are uh, students, un undergraduate and postgraduate students. So I chose this particular uh, presentation revolving around the student interest and the point of view of how to use the minimum resources that are available in the laboratory to perform the better quality uh, 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 research, you know, that applies uh, very close to final year uh, undergraduate students, uh, master students, even for the uh, doctoral students. Uh, this this work is uh, typical uh, uh, research work of uh, postgraduate engineering uh, students. So this work is uh, performed by one of my master students. In, in tribology, in this particular, in this, uh, can you can you see the next slide, or is there any la lag? Yes, sir, it is visible. It's visible, right? Okay. So in this particular, in this presentation, yes. um, thank you. 
Yeah, because otherwise I will keep talking about uh, uh, the slide which I can see and everybody else is still on the uh, previous slide. So I wanted to make sure that there is a smooth. Uh, Yes, sir. It is visible. Second slide. No, no okay. problem. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kakre. So, in this particular, in this presentation, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, different aspects on how to perform the uh, research with minimum resources. That is that is very important uh, key in this particular presentation, so that uh, the students or whoever is performing uh, uh, research will not feel that I do not have or we do not have the resources or we need all the technologies or all the testing tools you know to perform the research when it comes as uh, uh, it was mentioned that you know when it comes to the research you know there is a huge investment that is as a matter of fact uh, true because uh, when it comes to the major investment or capital investment all the uh, tools required uh, to perform the research are very expensive Right, but if if you will see through this particular work of uh, uh, one of my uh, graduate student that how we use minimum resources and very economical way to perform the research. So let me uh, cover uh, some of the aspects in this presentation. We we will cover very brief history of friction, rather major developments in the field of tribology. Then we will see how friction and wear plays a role in various uh, applications very briefly we will also see some fact and how money is related to tribology and where the problems are then what should we do about it the material selected for this uh, project was uh, ceramic based we will briefly discuss about some of the relevant properties of uh, a ceramic material further what material was selected and uh, what motivated to perform this particular research that will be followed by uh, experimental procedures uh, that is uh, divided into two one is the material preparation and the characterization and then uh, we will uh, discuss about the results and discussion and we will conclude the uh, presentation or this research work so most of you as uh, uh, I can uh, assume that we have in, uh, you have the engineering background and you must have uh, heard about friction friction what is a friction well in a very simple in very simple words friction is nothing but it's a surface resistance to relative motion right there is a Cambridge uh, dictionary meaning of uh, uh, friction i'm not going to go through that but you can imagine that you know when two surfaces are relatively moving against each other there is some kind of a resistance developed and that's that resistance is useful in many applications and not very useful in in uh, other applications right so let me go through uh, the next slide where the first time the friction was introduced or the concept of friction was uh, uh, come in picture that was uh, by sir leonardo da vinci and he measured the friction a very very simple way and that that was the first time the friction was recorded if you see the development in this area or that's where the tribology came into picture however the, tri uh, the science of tribology was there when since the civilizations were uh, civilization was started right but this that leonardo da vinci was the first one who methodically studied the friction after about 100 years after leonardo da vinci amantan gave the first uh, law of friction that was as we use even today that is the frictional force is pro uh, proportional to the applied load. That's where we use in our engineering courses that coefficient of friction equals to frictional force divided by applied load. And after Amanton's law, Coulomb gave the kinetic friction, uh, the law for uh, kinetic friction, which is kinetic friction is uh, independent on the sliding velocity. 
right these are the major developments i'm not going to go through the each and every uh, details about uh, the research and uh, uh, other developments these are the major uh, development in the field of tribology after coulomb's law there was another major uh, breakthrough in in the field of tribology that was bailby layer what he found that when two surfaces slide each other at the interface there is a film formation and that film or that layer is called the bailby layer and that layer has completely different properties compared to the bulk material or the material which initially undergone for the sliding up and that that is where the degradation mechanism and all the other theories uh, started coming into picture after that borden and huge gave along the same line of the belby uh, theory what they found that <clears throat> at the interface the material is dis uh, undergo our uh, uh, experience of very severe uh, deformation and because of the severe deformation the lattice is distorted and once the lattice is distorted in a continuous manner that would layer on the surface converts into amorphous layer and as we know that amorphous materials have very high mechanical property sometimes it <coughs> degrade the material even further and that contributes to the worsening of uh, uh, the interfaces after after borden and huge there was another uh, a breakthrough that was given uh, studied by borden and tabor that is very famous uh, it is called the theory of adhesion what they proposed or found that there is a compatibility between the materials so based on that compatibility the material transfer occurs for example there are two surfaces sliding each other what material should transform let's say material a on the top and material b on, on, on the bottom and if these two materials are sliding in each other whether material a should transfer to material b or material b should transfer to a that was given by the uh, borden and tabor theory recently as the nano nanotechnology came in picture that uh, uh, david rigney a professor from uh, ohio state university uh, showed that when the nano crystalline material slide each other at the interface they can be there can be a phase transfer occur and that phase, uh, because of that phase transfer the amorphous material can also be formed and along the same line uh, as there is always a demand for, uh, to develop a low uh, coefficient of friction uh, at the interface and the material uh, demand for the low low, uh, low coefficient of friction ali admir and his group at uh, national lab in chicago develop material that was a, uh, one of the major breakthrough that was a diamond like carbon coating that's a dlc coatings and it was shown that the dlc coating is a very very hard material and it has ultra low coefficient of friction now what exactly friction plays a role in day to day life or or when it comes to engineers mind we always think about what are the practical applications of friction or where right so these are i picked up very few application you can you can uh, uh, think about how friction is important you can think in transportation industry or in manufacturing industry i just put a few of the examples where friction plays a very important role such as piston ring cylinder lining bearings gears cutting to inserts rotors in biomedicine biomedicine and bio uh, engineering this is very uh, recent field actually you uh, sometimes we even don't think about how friction is uh, important for example in uh, medicinal pills that uh, how friction can uh, assist right and endoscopy uh, instrument right because uh, nowadays uh, there is even for the surgery actually in, in sur uh, surgical robots that the friction plays a very important role another very important application is artificial joints in textile industry there are lots of uh, 
movements and rotations of different parts actually where the threads are moved and uh, so some of the applications are yarn feeders draw rolls thread guides basically the friction plays a very very important role in the performance of those interfaces the reliability of the component and the service life of the entire mechanical system friction also overall friction contributes the total efficiency of that particular system let me let me put some of the facts how friction is useful or it is not useful now in the us on annual basis resources are wasted at the interface what does that mean when we are using a piston ring and cylinder interface or tool work interface or drill hole interface we are there is a loss of energy at that interface and that loss of energy in terms of the cost is around 40 billion dollars per year that is a lot of money right but if you consider only the automobile sector right if we improve the frictional performance or tribological uh, performance we can save about 14 billion dollars per annum that is 18 percent of total annual energy consumed by the cars now let me put a little more, more facts about uh, friction if we add friction with the corrosion right most most of the time corrosion is also associated with uh, friction in several applications we can think about the corrosion cost is around three percent of us gdp and that us gdp in 1999 was 8.8 .8 trillion dollars which was 13 trillion dollars in 2006 and last year it was 21 trillion dollars now you can calculate how many zeros you can add if you convert those one into indian rupees that's a huge cost that's three percent of the us gdp these are some of the cost of corrosion actually i just this is just the relative cost now uh, because if you add wear and uh, uh, wear to it this cost again increases and you can see that the major corrosion cost in the defense industry, drinking water and sewer uh, systems, and motor vehicles. I put this slide just to give you a perspective that uh, this could be the motivating factors that you can involve in developing the newer system or material systems. Well, if we are wasting so, so much of money, what can we do? Right. So one thing that what we can do is improve the performance at the interface of the sliding surface. What does that mean? We can either use uh, lubrication, better lubrication system. We can develop better lubrication systems or we can develop better materials at the interface or the combination of two. Right. One of the uh, approaches, we can develop the bulk material or we can develop the corrosion and wear resistance composites and coatings. Well, now let me let me come back to uh, this particular uh, research and th for this particular research we selected uh, ceramics why do we select it why why we selected ceramics uh, i will come to that one a little later but let me discuss uh, some of the uh, properties that can be compared with other uh, material such as uh, metals and polymers so you will get kind of uh, idea that why ceramics uh, uh, was selected for this particular uh, uh, project. You can see that the ceramic have uh, higher hardness. It has higher uh, temperature strength, high temperature strength. Ceramic also possesses very good corrosion resistance. It also has wear resistance. And another important thing is that it has a very low density. And one of the important things is that ceramic pose a very good potential uh, in high temperature applications. Now, if you think about any uh, engine component, let's say in automobile industry, right? So the performance of the engine or any moving component at high temperature is primarily derived by the limit 
of uh, that material at uh, performance at high temperature. If you think about high temperature material, polymers out of question. And there are very limited material, uh, metallic materials. But there are some exhaustive, uh, uh, exotic metallic material, but the cost is very, very high. So when it comes to the uh, bringing down the cost, we need to look at a very common and readily available material you know, uh, uh, to be used for these applications. So for this particular project, we selected alumina. And why, why did we select it? Alumina was readily available, you know, around, and it's very uh, cost effective. And also, it has a very good properties. Strength of alumina, uh, alumina is very well known for its very high strength, stiffness, hardness. It also has wear, uh, wear resistance. It also possesses very good corrosion and chemical resistance. Another important property of alumina is the thermal stability, right? And for most of the ceramics, as they have very good uh, near net shape capability that they can hold the shape, you know, in uh, during the processing. And alumina is also being uh, used as as biomaterial uh, applications actually in in implant uh, material. This is one of the very good uh, applications that uh, being developed. You can see that couple of applications uh, here, the rotor blade and the gears are made up of, uh, made, uh, of alumina. Well, now there are certain limitations for alumina as well. You can see that I did not mention the coefficient of friction, the friction problem. It, it does have wear resistance, but how about the coefficient of friction? In some application, if there is no wear, but still very high friction, that might not be uh, applicable because there will be a lot of uh, heat generated at the interface. Right? Then there, is, there are uh, different approaches uh, taken to reduce the coefficient of friction of uh, alumina-based material. One approach is composite material. Now, I gave here only three uh, studies. Uh, the point here to make is uh, what are these re reinforcement material and why uh, this material were not selected for this particular uh, project. The first one was uh, alumina matrix and graphite reinforcement. Now, graphite has a very limited uh, applications. Graphite is being used currently as a reinforcement material, but graphite do not have a very good high temperature performance. Graphite has a very good uh, coefficient of friction, very low coefficient of, uh, coefficient of friction uh, for that matter. But graphite cannot be performed. Or graphite is not good at high, high, high temperature. Now there are two other uh, composite materials that being used. Where given here, most both of the materials you can see they are very uh, what I would say is very expensive. You can see the other reinforcement material being used as uh, boron nitride. There is again graphite and there is molybdenum disulfide. But these materials are very, very expensive. So another thing is that these materials are separately added as a reinforcement material. So there is a cost involved for this material separately for the synthesis of uh, uh, this material. So our target, our motiv uh, motivation was to see if we can form low coefficient uh, phases in situ when we make this material for example when we are talking about ceramics so when we use the ceramic processing we do not want to add a foreign material as a, a low coefficient of friction phase rather than we wanted to see some in situ phases formed so that the properties will be uniform and the cost will come down it will be economical right so for that matter we looked at uh, some of the uh, systems and one of the systems we found that uh, alumina or aluminum and uh, boron has uh, certain phases they possess a very good uh, crystal structure that uh, favors low, low coefficient of friction if you see here that uh, this is the boron rich uh, portion of uh, aluminum boron uh, system where you can see that there is one phase formed at very low temperature, right? Why do we select low temperature? Because it's better 
economically because we don't need to waste money or uh, uh, to form certain phases at a high temperature right you can see that the aluminum uh, this is alb2 that's aluminum diborides are formed in this particular uh, system and you can also see that the percentage of aluminum diboride is very very less so that was the motivation to see if we can you know produce or develop this uh, uh, composite materials which can form the in situ phases right therefore we we uh, <coughs> develop the objective to develop the new class of alumina composite that has low coefficient of friction and the friction performing or per, uh, uh, friction low coefficient of friction phases must form in situ all right so i will discuss uh, about the experimental uh, procedure that uh, what materials uh, well now you know already what materials we, uh, were uh, chosen uh, how the samples were prepared and what characterization techniques were uh, used to characterize the composite material uh, developed right so alumina that we already discussed uh, alumina which we started with has a uh, very coarse uh, grain size around 14 uh, micron now let me tell you uh, this that we don't need to really go in the market and find out any particular uh, quality alumina this alumina was used which was being purchased for uh, uh, metallurgy lab for the polishing uh, application now you might be knowing that in metallurgy uh, we do the uh, microstructure study that's where we can we use uh, alumina powder for polishing so that is a typical alumina powder we use and we uh, bought the amorphous boron uh, powder which has a 2 to 10 micron uh, 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 grain size right now how did we prepare the samples you can see that it's a uniaxial pellet press uh, which is very uh, very economical and if you think uh, about the mechanical engineering students they can build this pre uh, press actually uh, in lab so it is not very expensive tool to uh, to be developed right so the most important thing is that you need to uh, uh, probably buy the dye that that need to be used for powder compaction and uh, the green compacts were uh, prepared at uh, <coughs> 10 mega pascal load for 5 uh, minutes and those uh, samples were sintered uh, at two different temperatures at uh, 1200 degrees celsius and 1500 degrees celsius for 1 hour right and you can see that uh, the green comp uh, the sintered uh, samples shown here right pretty nice uh, very dense uh, samples were prepared and uh, what we did in this particular uh, study that we vary the percentage of boron uh, at two different uh, sintering temperature and we, you will see that as as we go for, uh, further when we discuss about the uh, results and the characterization tools we used were x-ray diffraction and FTIR that is for phase uh, phase identification. Basically, we wanted to find out if the targeted phase phases are formed or not. Remember, we we uh, we dis we targeted to form the in situ phases, right? So X-ray diffraction and Fourier trans uh, FTIR will uh, tell uh, tell that. Well, well, then we use the Archimedes principle uh, to. find uh, measure the density now this uh, property measurement does not require any high tech uh, uh, equipment you can build your own every analysis right so these are the typical characterization for particular 
percentage Uh, from 1 to 3 so we have 1% towards sent and 3% boron and those samples were uh, sintered at 1200 and 1500 degrees celsius now as you can see from this two there are very clear distinction between uh, the phases formed in in this two uh, uh, different set of uh, samples sorry uh, <coughs> my throat is drying so i had to drink some water All right. So if you, if you look at twelve uh, hundred degrees cel Celsius, well, the matrix is present. That is alumina, and uh, remember we were targeting for aluminum diboride that is formed, and even for fifteen hundred degrees Celsius, diboride is formed and there is a matrix available. Right. However, if you see at twelve hundred degrees Celsius, there is a two additional phases formed. One is boron oxide, and another is aluminum borate. right you might want to just keep in mind that you know there is aluminum borate phase formed at 1200 degrees celsius right but when we when you look at uh, x-ray diffraction a little closer that you will okay so i think i i just uh, uh, repeated this uh, diffraction results so if you look at the x-ray diffraction closer here you might observe something that the intensity of the peaks are different if you see this 1% boron since uh, the sample center at 1200 degrees celsius you see this height of this peak you, you can make a conclusion on your own as the percentage of boron increasing the height of this particular peak is increased what is this peak for this is a borate phase right and similarly if you i'm sorry similar similarly if you look at the sample sin uh, x-ray diffraction pattern for the sample center at 1500 degrees celsius similar peak has a reverse trend you can see that 1% boron the intensity is little higher but 3% boron that peak is going down and that particular phase is borate phase okay now this is this is the uh, thing that you you might want to keep in mind when we discuss the results that will uh, that will be handy now here i uh, put another phase diagram which is uh, <coughs> alumina and oxide phase of boron if you see here this is the phase that is the borate phase and if you see that this borate phase is not stable at high temperature okay. now you don't need to worry about just keep this one in mind that the borate phase is not stable at high temperature right and we will see what is the effect of that particular property on the uh, frictional or uh, friction and wear performance of this particular composite material right and there's another uh, observation we uh, <coughs> did was there was the oxide phase of boron even at both uh, temperature centering uh, samples actually uh, that we found through the fourier transfer uh, ftir study it, it we couldn't find it in in the you see that for the 1500 degrees uh, celsius centering sample we couldn't find the boron oxide phase right so what we can confirm from the phase identification or phase uh, characterization that the targeted phases right 
the boron uh, aluminum diboride phase was formed apart from that there was additional phase was observed that was aluminum borate right so other characterization we did was uh, density measurement and the porosity measurement so what we did is we have two different sintering temperatures and we have three concentration of boron so what we this particular diagram shows that the effect of sintering temperature and concentration of boron on the density and porosity of this uh, composite material we can make a very simple observation here if you see uh, for the for the density study for 1500 degrees celsius uh, sintering uh, what happened the density of the samples is reducing right whereas the density of uh, sample at uh, sintered at 1200 degrees celsius is increasing right that is something uh, uh, you 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 will find the answer on your own as we uh, discuss further and if you look at the porosity right what happened at 1500 degrees celsius sample the porosity of this particular sample is increasing right and the 1200 degrees celsius the porosity is increasing now this porosity is only surface uh, porosity okay this is this is closed porosity it's not open porosity so we did the porosity measurement only on the surface right let me go to the next uh, uh, observation and uh, here yeah this is this is where you can see that uh, this uh, polished surface that's where we can calculate the uh, porosity right so 1200 degrees celsius and 1500 degrees celsius samples so we have different porosity uh, you can it is very easy, uh, visible actually you can see the change in porosity for both samples these are only representative samples right so 1% and 3% so we took the two extremes right let's uh, look at the grain size measurement okay. again the effect of sintering temperature and concentration of boron on the grain size measurement of this uh, samples now if you see what happened to the grain size of uh, composites which are uh, which were sintered at 1500 degrees celsius the grain size was reducing right as the percentage of boron increased right whereas the trend is the same right but the grain size is higher for 1200 degree celsius uh, uh, samples uh, which were sintered at 1200 degree celsius right so if you increase the sintering temperature the grain size is going down so you get the finer grain now some of you might be already thinking about what is the effect of grain size on the mechanical properties right when the gra grain size uh, reduces some of the mechanical properties improve right now Uh, there is some kind of a lag here can, can you can you see the uh, slight transition dr kakade yes sir yes sir you, you can still see it yes, right sir. okay because there was some kind of a uh, you know uh, signal lag on my screen it went blank no sir it is clear. clearly visible on your screen okay so we are good right all right so yes. here uh, if we look at uh, some of the microstructures uh, and that this will tell us that uh, this is a very typical uh, composite uh, structure formed with the in situ phases you know formation you can see that the secondary phases uh, formed on the, on the surface here and for the uh, two samples we selected one is uh, 3% boron sintered at 1500 degrees celsius and 3% boron sintered at 1200 degrees celsius there are secondary phases now this this is only microstructural study so we we will not be able to find out what particular phase is that right But this confirms that there are this is this is not just the alumina right this is not just the alumina matrix there are certain phases formed right now being uh, you can see that there was a, a huge porosity on the surface it was extremely difficult to measure the hardness of this samples actually so what we did is we just did the relative measurement of the hardness you can see that the diagonals of these two samples 
can see that the two two percent uh, boron at sintered at uh, 1200 degrees celsius and three percent uh, boron sample sintered at 1200 degrees celsius as the boron percent is increasing so there is you can see that relatively the diameter of this particular indent is increasing so what does that mean the in the hardness is slightly reducing but it, it was it, it was very difficult to make any uh, uh, conclusion on hardness measurement so i will not put any conclusive remark on the hardness because there is there is uh, still need to be uh, further study on on that uh, uh, property right let me let me talk about the surface roughness because this is one of the very important uh, parameter that is required for uh, the tribological study right so what we did is we did the surface me uh, measure uh, measurement surface roughness measurement in two different uh, scenario one is as sintered sample and second one is polished sample right so what would happen is if we polish the sample the effect of the uh, surface poros uh, porosity will come in picture and as in per, uh, center sample we will have all the uh, surface features you know in intact right so you can see for 1200 degree uh, sample uh, sint uh, center samples as the percentage of boron increasing let's say as sintered samples only that uh, there is not much difference between the uh, uh, hardness uh, i'm sorry the surface roughness however the surface roughness overall surface roughness is decreasing right for 1200 degrees celsius uh, samples but when we polish the samples you can see that the surface roughness is reduced that's that's that is uh, obvious right so when you polish the sample so the surface becomes smoother but in in case of uh, 1500 uh, degrees celsius sample uh, sintered samples you can see you see the strain is slightly different compared to the 1200 degrees celsius sample what happened to this surface roughness the surface roughness is increasing as the percentage of boron is increasing right and when we when we polish this is okay i think because uh, the sur uh, surface roughness uh, will go down it, the uh, surface will be smoothened out but what is happening when we increase the percentage of boron and uh, sintered at 1500 degrees celsius surface becoming very very rough right you will find out why right very soon well then the surface roughness uh, related another property that the contact angle measurement right so if you see the contact angle that uh, for uh, samples sintered at 1200 degrees celsius the contact angle is kind of uh, very similar not much change right but when we polished i'm sorry as sintered sample right because see, when we when you polish the sample basically we are we are taking out all the asperities and you know uh, the uh, so contact angle will will be kind of uniform right but when you look at the as sintered sample the contact angle is increasing right as the percentage of boron <coughs> is increased that might have some some effect of uh, the phages formed and in in the the in situ phages formed in in the composite right but when you look at the 1500 degree celsius uh, uh, sintered sample of uh, the sample sintered at 1500 degree celsius uh, as polished sample the contact angle is slightly decreasing okay and the trend is same for uh, as sintered sample also but the contact angle is very less what does that mean basically when we sinter the sample at 1500 degrees celsius the water is spreading out very easily right whereas if when we polish the water is not spreading that easy you can see this contact angle is very high right now with these these are the uh, physical characterization let's move to the uh, tribological characterization so that we can find out what is the effect of these phases or whatever the uh, properties we saw for both the sets you know the effect of uh, boron as well as the sintering temperature on this particular composite right so we performed 
very typical dry recipe, uh, reciprocating ball and flat test using the uh, 52100 bearing ball. That is very common, 6 mil, uh, millimeter diameter as a counterpart. The applied load was 1 Newton and sliding speed was uh, 1 centimeter per second. And each test was performed for 30 minutes, around 2000 seconds. Now this is the control sample, which is alumina, right? So if you look at the coefficient of friction, which is pretty high, right? So point it's 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 kind of 0.45, right? More than more than 0.4. But important thing is that the coefficient of friction is consistently. You can see that uh, increasing because there was a uh, severe surface damage actually. If, if you see. This particular picture on the right side on your screen is the frustum of that uh, bearing ball. Right? It was severely damaged. And that is, uh, you can think about because it's uh, alumina, right? Alumina and steel ball. Alumina is a very, very hard. So the resultant will be a damage of the uh, bearing ball, right? But when we looked at the composite that we made this is the average coefficient of friction we will go uh, we will go into the detail of each and every curve but what we found that the coefficient of friction of the samples centered at 1200 degrees celsius and when the boron percent is increased what is happening the coefficient of friction is increasing right so we add more boron coefficient of friction increases. The trend is the same. When you add more boron, the coefficient of friction is increased. However, the average coefficient of friction is very, very low compared to, you can see the difference here, 1200 degrees Celsius. So at least we know that if we center the samples at 1500 degrees Celsius, we get surface or the composite which perform much better in terms of the coefficient of friction. Now we need to find out why. Is that right? So let's go to the uh, some of the representative uh, coefficient of uh, friction curves. And you can see the clear distinct uh, distinction or a clear difference between those curves. Now here in this particular uh, slide, all the red color curves are for uh, composite samples centered at 1200 degrees Celsius and the blue sample uh, blue curves are for 1500 degrees Celsius samples. You can one thing is very clear even for the previous slide that the coefficient of friction of the all the samples centered at 1500 degrees Celsius are have a low coefficient of friction is that right and it, this is very clear from this one but oh, I wanted to bring your attention to one fact look at the start of the test okay look at the start of the test the behavior of this particular uh, both the curves is completely different right if you look at all three composite samples and the coefficient of friction curve the start of the friction is very low and gradually friction increases. You can see for all three curves. Whereas the sample centered at 1500 degrees Celsius, the initial coefficient of friction is very high, but as the test continues, something happens at the interface and the coefficient of friction kind of reduces in all three curves, right? Now, just to uh, recap that when we looked at the uh, X-ray diffraction of this um, uh, composite material, there was one phase form in both the uh, uh, samples that was aluminum diborite, right? And that was our intention. Originally, we wanted to see if the aluminum diborides will be formed. And what we found that the aluminum diborite have a layered structure very similar to graphite right 
So you might want to just keep in mind that now aluminum diboride is very similar to graphite. So if there is aluminum diboride phase, the friction might be coming down because there is the shear strength is very low if, uh, at the inter uh, uh, interplanular uh, bonding. Is that right? Or simply think about graphite. Okay, it's a layered structure. But what we found is remember in uh, X-ray diffraction uh, diagram there is a aluminum a borate phase form, right? In composite material, uh, composite samples sintered at 1200 degrees Celsius. But what we found is that those aluminum borate phases actually decompose above five, uh, five, five uh, sorry, 1400 degrees Celsius. Remember I showed you the phase diagram also that the aluminum borate phases are not stable at higher temperature, right? And what happens? Look here. One phase formed is alumina, which is very similar to the matrix. And second phase is formed is a boron oxide phase, right? So now here at 1400 degrees Celsius, boron oxide phase is a gaseous phase. Now think about the sample, which is a sintered sample, solid material. What will happen to the gas which is formed on the surface of the sample? The boron oxide gas will escape, is right? So when some of the material is escaped as a gaseous form, what will happen to the surface? There will be more porosity developed, right? But what will happen to the surface? What will happen to those gases which are entrapped underneath the surface? Well, they will entrap there, and as the temperature cools down, they will again condense back into a some kind of a phase, right? Now, you might want to think in terms of why the surface roughness was different for the samples sintered at 1500 degrees Celsius. Now this this will give you the clue, right? Now when you when you come back to the coefficient of friction, think about the boron oxide, right? So on the surface, the boron oxide is not present. Now again, let me let me bring your attention to one another fact that uh, boron oxide is also a uh, phase that reduces the coefficient of friction, right? And another very close material that we all know, very close to the boron oxide, is that we all use actually at one point of time in our life, uh, is called the boric acid, right? You must have played carom. So we use the boric acid as a solid lubricant in the, on the carom board. And when you add actually water or hydrogen to this boric, uh, boron oxide, it becomes boric acid. And you all know that boric acid has a very good coefficient of friction, very low coefficient of friction, right? Very similarly, so the boron oxide has a coefficient of friction which is lower compared to the borate phases, right? So whenever there is a borate phase present, the borate phases have a very high hardness and it is giving a very high coefficient of, coefficient of friction. All the samples sintered at 1200 degrees Celsius has higher coefficient of friction, right? Whereas samples sintered as 1500 degrees Celsius, the borate phases are de decomposed into alumina and bor uh, boron oxide or, or the uh, oxide phase of boron. However, when the degradation happen, they, because on the surface, there is no boron oxide because it's already escaped. When this degradation happen and the subsurface is an open up, right? After, after the damage of this uh, top layer, what happens? There is another layer or there is the, the other phase of uh, boron oxide come on the surface and that provides the coefficient, a lower coefficient of friction. And that you can see that the coefficient of friction of all the samples sintered at 1500 degrees Celsius is much lower compared to the uh, samples sintered at 1200 degrees Celsius, right? Let's go back and see how the surfaces were degraded at the, at, at the interface. 
right now this is a, a typical wear track of uh, 3% uh, uh, boron sample sintered at 1200 degrees celsius on the right hand side you can see that this is the frustum or this is the bearing ball right that was worn now if we know the diameter of this particular bearing ball or, or uh, this uh, frustum and the diameter of the spear we can easily calculate how much volume loss right and that is typically our wear volume right let me, let, let me come back to uh, the worn surface right now here you can see the top left corner is actually the track right this image is taken somewhere in this uh, dark region in, in, in the in the black region right and you can see that all the degradation happen on the wear track this is which uh, very obvious right now the, can you still see the slide I, my screen is all dark actually doctor you can still see right yes at the corner right is uh, visible sir corner. okay because <laughs> My my presentation is not moving. Yes, sir. Two screens are overlap now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that is ideal, sir. Now, now you can see, right? Now it's clear. No, sir. Not yet. Not yet. Sir, again, again, screen share, sir. Please. Okay, can I stop it? Let me stop it and uh, share it again. Okay. 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 All right. Let one see. I'm sorry. I think this is an internet issue. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, let me go back. Okay. Can you see now? No, oh, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Now it is visible. Yes, sir. Now it is visible. Okay. So now we are talking about the own surface analysis. Now the date is already eighteen uh, September here, so we started on seventeen September. Yes, sir. All right. So if you look at the worn surface, right on the top uh, left corner, all the uh, surface damage you can see very very visible. So we took like a, a high resolution uh, image on the sintered surface. You can see that uh, the start surface actually that's where we started, and the surface damage is pretty severe, right after. And you can. You could also see in the previous image that uh, even uh, the bearing ball was also worn out, right? So we will find out uh, little details about what are the mechanisms by which the surfaces were damaged, right? Now we are talking about uh, both uh, samples. These are the representative images. One is on the left-hand side, which is for uh, 1200 degrees Celsius uh, sintered sample. Right, so here 1200 degrees Celsius, and this is for 1500 degrees Celsius. Now, if you look at very closely, that uh, <clears throat> here for uh, I do not know whether you can see my highlighter. So there is. Uh, can you see here? Now, if if you can see, I, I highlighted by uh, yellow. That is a very typical, uh, you know, feature, where. The grain is pulled out. What does that mean? So when two surfaces are sliding, or this is now we are talking about ceramic failure, right? So when the surface, when the grain is pulled out, right? That type of uh, failure, what we can call call as transgranular failure. Basically, the the grain might have a good strength, but there is not a good strength between two grains. So the grain is all. Uh, it pulled out because of the shear stresses generated on the surface, right? You can see that the grain pull out in both the samples, right? And there are also certain indications of cracks. You can see that there is, if if you can see that there are a couple of cracks developed here. There are some cracks developed here, and. Uh, this this is not very clear, but there there is a crack develop on this surface also. What does that mean? Well, it there is one mechanism by which these surfaces are damaged. One is the transgranular, uh, uh, and second one is 
the intraglanular. So basically what we can say that the samples were degraded by the mixed method. So we have both indications that transgranular or uh, intragranular uh, mechanism, right? And as I mentioned that if we know the diameter of uh, the sphere and uh, the radius or the diameter of the sp uh, sphere and the diameter of the sprustum, we can easily calculate the wear volume, right? And the wear volume calculated for uh, both the sets uh, centered at 1500 degrees Celsius and centered at 1200 degrees Celsius. And you can see that 1200 degrees Celsius, 1% of boron, the volume of uh, this, uh, this uh, wear volume is pretty high, right? Now you can you can very easily relate that why that could be right one percent of boron 1200 degrees celsius and another sample you can see here two percentage of boron and 1500 degrees celsius the that is the lowest volume right now when we relate this one with the phases form you should be able to very easily correlate that why this particular volume is high this is the volume of the material for the bearing ball. So what does that mean? At 1200 degrees Celsius, the sample uh, centered at 1200 degrees Celsius with one percentage of boron, lot of material was worn out from the bearing ball. What does that mean? That means the sample centered at 1200 degrees Celsius with one percentage of boron do not have very good friction properties. Does that make sense? Right? High friction, high wear for the counter phase. Right? And when you look at the wear debris, now this is a uh, typical analysis we perform for the counter phase that uh, <coughs> this EDS image shows some of the elements. right present in the debris now we are we are talking about the two material degradation right so we have the alumina uh, composite which was also degraded and the bearing ball so this is a typical uh, uh, debris material which shows the composition from the both material you can see that there is alumina here and there is a boron also there and there is also iron and chromium you can see that the composition of uh, the bearing ball here we have carbon chromium iron manganese phosphorus silicon and uh, sulfur apart from these elements there are the composite material elements are also present so this is a typical that the contamination from the both side of the materials right now let's compare the wear volume and the coefficient of friction right so what is the sintering temperature effect on the and the concentration of boron on wear volume and coefficient of friction let's talk about uh, sample sintered at 1200 degrees celsius what is happening here you can see that wear volume is very high is that right and the coefficient of friction is relatively low here and you can see that the coefficient of friction is increasing but the wear volume is going down now uh, what we uh, discussed was the, co uh, <clears throat> the coefficient of friction might not be good for this particular sample right but if you look at this compared to the 1500 degree celsius sample right 1500 degree celsius sample for one percent of uh, boron the coefficient of friction is very low right Compared to 1500 degrees Celsius sintered sample, the coefficient of friction is not very good, right? And it's also giving very high wear of the sphere, right? Similarly, as we increase the percentage of boron, right, the coefficient of friction is increasing. So that is not in our fear, uh, in, in our fear, favor. However, the degradation of the counter face is reducing. Right, that might be something we can think about. Now, if you think in terms of the applications, even if 
slightly the coefficient of friction is increasing but the degradation of the counter face is reducing right whereas the 1500 degree uh, celsius sample was relatively non conclusive you can see that uh, the coefficient of friction is increasing with the percentage of boron however the uh, coefficient of friction is always lower compared to the 1200 degree celsius sample but the where uh, we can see that the second sample it might have some kind of uh, erroneous re results but however if you see that first and uh, last uh, set of sample that the wear is also increasing with the coefficient of friction right which is completely different behavior uh, for 1500 degree celsius sample and that we can relate this behavior with the phases formed and how the phases are converted in in uh, or transformed in, into uh, or decomposed in, into the different phases right with with that let me let me uh, make some observations here that uh, what we did here is we used a readily available material in 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 the lab right and the material or or the composites uh, prepared even the technique used is very very simple right the only material that was uh, relatively expensive was the boron the amorphous boron which was not really uh, like very expensive but uh, really that is the only component that was uh, expensive and what we found is that uh, the phase identification study showed that there there is a borate phase form aluminum diboride phase form and the ftr also the study also confirmed that the boron oxide phases were formed for both set of samples right now the increasing the sintering temperature and weight percentage of boron has a very uh, obvious effect on all of uh, porosity grain size hardness of the composite right now however the hardness was a little bit uh, difficult to measure so uh, we will not talk about that we 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 really need little further study on that but however if you look at the compositions of those samples for 1200 degree celsius uh, sintered uh, uh, sample there was a phase called borate phase and borate phase has a very high hardness definitely we can predict or we can we can uh, think that the hardness of this uh, composite sample sintered at 1200 degree celsius might have higher hardness when you talk about coefficient of friction coefficient of, uh, coefficient of friction of the composite was relatively lower compared to the alumina ceramic that's a control sample but within the composites the coefficient of friction of all the samples sintered at 1500 degree celsius was very low compared to the 1200 degree celsius sintered samples the composition of aluminum borate that we saw the reaction we saw at above 1400 degree celsius gave us boron oxide right and the presence of aluminum diboride provided the lower coefficient of friction for the samples at uh, sintered at the 1500 degrees celsius cell. that is clear right because of the aluminum di uh, aluminum borate phases decomposed that give us uh, provided additional uh, uh, mechanism for lower coefficient where mechanism were found at micro fracture that is uh, typical of uh, any uh, uh, ceramic material we would like to uh, do little uh, further study that is what is the effect of uh, these phases on the wear mechanism or or how the ceramic materials uh, might have fractured that is something we we might need to we need to study further right and uh, let me make the final remark as a composite with optimum coefficient of friction and wear volume of the counter face can be selected depending on the application if you look at those two diagrams i might have the diagram at the end okay now if you look at this particular diagram we can easily target the application if if you need or if we need a low coefficient of friction right that simply changing the percentage of boron or the sintering temperature we can easily tailor the properties of those composites right or if you look if if we need 
a low coefficient of friction, but wear, uh, <coughs> less wear, definitely what we do is we center the sample at lower temperature. Now, typically, let's say 1200 degrees Celsius or the decomposition lower than the decomposition temperature of those borate phases because we wanted those borate phases present in our composite so that it will provide the additional uh, uh, mechanism to lower the, uh, the wear volume. Whereas if we need lower coefficient of friction and we are not worrying about the volume relatively, right? Then definitely what we do is we will increase the sintering temperature so that the borate phases decompose and we uh, we get the boron oxide phase for additional uh, coefficient reduction. And with that, I will uh, make a conclusion of this present presentation. Again, uh, in the beginning, I told uh, told you that this was a typical master's thesis. And uh, at the end, uh, the student has several publications out of this particular uh, research work. And interestingly, that uh, you can see that the very good uh, results uh, came out of this particular uh, thesis. And the student won almost all the awards uh, available for the graduate students on campus. Uh, she won, uh, you might be knowing that uh, the National Societies, uh, Tribology Societies uh, Student Award. She also won a Graduate Student Research Poster Award and uh, Women in Engineering Award as well. And she also made the presentation of this particular research in uh, several uh, conferences. And you can think about, uh, you know, designing your own project, actually, that uh, there is not uh, uh, high tech equipments needed to have on campus, actually. So you can also use the uh, national lab facilities or uh, other universities, for example, in if you talk about India, you know, uh, there are only few uh, tools that we used, you know, those we need to go outside the campus, for example, scanning electron microscope, or x ray diffraction, right, but you don't need those tools to have on campus, you know, and that does not limit your work. As long as you, you perform your work, uh, making the samples and other characterization, these tools can be utilized very easily off of the campus also. And with that, I will open uh, the floor for questions if you have any. Over to uh, Dr. Amol. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are, sir? Yes, sir. Hi, yes, sir. Hi, sir. There are a few questions. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Can I, can I uh, stop? So the, the uh, first question is? Hi, yes, sir. You can stop that presentation. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the question is from uh, one of uh, our participants, Satish Suryamashi. Sir, yes. why you have selected temperature 1200 and 15 degree, uh, 1500 degree centigrade? Any specific reason? Or can we go for another temperature combinations also? Yeah, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, Are I you able to hear that question, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I your question. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, well, the... Uh, Selecting this uh, sintering temperature is governed by your metric phase, right? So you need to find out okay. what, for example, in this particular uh, uh, study, we are using alumina, right? So we need to find out what is the uh, uh, temperature, uh, sintering temperature typically used for aluminum oxide, right? That governs the sintering temperature, right? So we... Okay, sir. For example, if you reduce the sintering temperature, it is possible that your uh, uh, composite or your samples may not uh, form like a uh, what we say the <coughs> powder compaction, right? So your sinters uh, uh, will not your samples will not be sintered, you know. So we did actually uh, sintering at lower temperature too. And we saw that uh, the samples were just crumbling 
because we okay, wanted, okay. We wanted our, our target was to use the lower temperature because you know lower the temperature it's better for uh, economy right so we can save money on on the energy right but the, the actually the simpling temperature selection is primarily governed by the uh, matrix phase remember you, yes, you, you must have seen that the phase diagram i showed that the in situ phase formation does not go on the sintering temperature because we selected boron uh, from the aluminum and uh, boron uh, phase diagram where the aluminum diboride phases were forming at very low temperature right so then we need to worry about the sint uh, sintering of the matrix material so the sintering temperature primarily go on by the sintering of aluminum right and the sintering the alumina is being used for many different applications so the sintering temperature is readily available in the literature does that answer your question yes sir yes sir okay thank you ah uh, yes sir. next question is sir uh, now the case study that uh, uh, you have discussed with us so what are the typical applications of the developed composite and uh, if you are talking about uh, uh, their specific temperature range uh, up to which this can be implemented in real life application yeah very good question actually yeah well think about alumina right so alumina can be utilized for uh, several applications particularly see again this is ceramic material like these are ceramic com uh, uh, composites so if we think in terms of uh, engine component or where there is a lot of vibration or a uh, lot of stress we might not be able to use uh, ceramic material because the failure of ceramic material is sudden right it does not give any indication it shatters so it, it will be a little difficult but if you think in terms of uh, let's say textile uh, applications remember i showed you some of the applications in textile industry where yes, there is a, there is a huge issue of uh, breaking up threads think about uh, any textile application and you have fast moving machines right even one thread breaks the entire system has to be stopped right so if we develop such uh, composites now these are again room temperature applications right but there are certain applications uh, that can be explored uh, relatively high higher temperature where the mechanical strength or the failure might not be uh, very similar to the metallic uh, uh, composite material okay sir is that answer ah yes sir yes sir yes. so there is one another question uh, why yes, debris sure. debris analysis of counterpart is done why debris analysis debris. oh yeah yeah okay. yeah, yeah sure, sure 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 Well, that that gives us the indication. Sometimes what happens is now in this case, if we see that uh, the worn surface were very severe, right? Now as we increase, or or when the material properties are very uh, superior, sometimes the surface may not be able to uh, show the degradation, right? As a matter of fact, one of the samples actually, uh, I I did not put the image there, that uh, we realize. that uh, there was no uh, surface damage of uh, this alumina okay what we saw is only black line okay there was no degradation at all we thought that there is no degradation of the composite material and only the phase uh, or only the counter phase that the, the bearing ball was wearing out right but that's where when we took the debris out and did the analysis that analysis showed that there are certain components also from the composite material right so what happens is when we do the debris analysis you also get the information how the counter phase is wearing out there's another in, uh, information we can get from the debris analysis is that if there is any uh, phase tra uh, transformation on the surface also remember we talked about the phase transformation and why the coefficient of friction was reducing about the composites only right but when we have the interface for example in this case we have a uh, 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 bearing ball right so there might be phase transformation at the interface right how do we know if that phase transformation is occurring or if there is any uh, different mechanical properties uh, of those uh, interfaces that we can get knowledge from the debris analysis as well 
is that is that clear yes sir yes sir okay sir there is one another question what sure. are the various applications of alumina based composite materials yeah that's i think i discussed that with, uh, just few minutes before right so when yes, for room temperature application you can think about the uh, uh, textile industry if you if you look at the, in textile industry majority of uh, those uh, uh, revolving uh, materials right those spindles and uh, most of them are ceramic materials right and okay. uh, and primary failure of those threads think about how fast those threads rotate uh, moves on on those uh, 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 surfaces if there is and and you can think about the speed and the heat generated at the interface right very typical application if we could reduce the coefficient of friction there you know you can have the longer life for those uh, or or we, we can have better uh, performing equipments right that is one of the applications right <clears throat> okay sir sir there is one another question sir what is spark plasma sintering yeah that is a relatively new technique uh, uh, being developed actually uh, the technique is uh, right now it's a laboratory scale it's not yet industrialized and wh what happens is uh, in spark plasma sintering we use the uh, plasma generated now so you you use this uh, sample in graphite or uh, related dye and generate a plasma at very high power and the materials can be sintered in a fraction of uh, time compared to the conventional sintering process in this case you you should you, you could see that the sintering uh, time for this particular uh, composite was uh, one hour right if we use the same material using spark plasma uh, sintering we can do the sintering maybe within few uh, few minutes right another thing of uh, uh, pr uh, pr uh, spark plasma sintering is that you can retain the grain structure so what happens if we use the conventional method right the way the method we used and we start with nano crystalline grains right or nano powder and we used uh, nano powder with conventional method for sintering the material after sintering will no more nano structure right so it will convert into conventional material whereas when we use the uh, 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 spark plasma sintering we can retain that grain structure so if we, if we, if you need to make like a nano uh, crystalline composite material or nano crystalline material that you wanted uh, to retain the crystal structure or the grain structure then the spark uh, plasma sintering is uh, the best method yes sir uh, hello sir, what you think yes sir yes sir uh, uh, sir just i want to include one thing so what is sir approximate uh, the cost of this uh, setup oh uh, well the experimental setup uh, first thing is that most of these equipments are already up, available in most of the mechanical engineering departments right so we have the furnace right so furnace most of our metallurgy department should have for if we uh, talk about the furnace cost in india i am not really sure but uh, in the us uh, it, the furnace cost was not very high the furnace which uh, showed in that particular uh, study it was $1000 so $1000 you multiply by 70 right yes, sir. so not not very very expensive and whereas the press the uniaxial press was made in uh, china so that was also not very expensive so the whole setup actually uh, Well, I I I would not uh, think it it is more than like a three thousand dollars. Okay, sir. Thank you. Right, and most yes, of the sir. technique uh, like a uh, uh, characterization tools were used outside the campus. For example, scanning electron microscope, even X-ray diffraction. You know, for the students, most of them were free. Yes, sir. But as a matter of Then fact, the uniaxial press can be developed in the lab. Actually, it's. it's or even most of the mechanical engineering lab has the uh, presses right mechanical presses we can use those mechanical presses the only thing is that you might invest in the dies so i remember that the die cost was like 150 dollars 
Yes, sir. You know, because see, if 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 you can also make the dye at, at in in the workshop also, right? You can use the uh, steel material and uh, make the dye, and you can heat treat it also, right? So very doable. It's very doable actually. And you can see that very important information you can you can generate. It's very high quality uh, research results. Yes, sir. So there is one another question. Uh, yeah, sure. There is a formation of secondary phase in both the sintered composites. How it will affect the friction properties? A oh, secondary phase, right? Yes. Sir. What do you mean by secondary phase? Well, uh, well, secondary phase in terms of the decomposition of borates, right? So yes. remember the borate we we uh, talked about. The 1200 degrees, uh, the sample sintered at 1200 degrees Celsius has a borate phase, right? Whereas the sample sintered at 1500 degrees Celsius did not have borate phase, right? So the low, low coefficient of both samples have the boron oxide phase and aluminum diborite. Mm -hmm. So primary, the lower coefficient of friction for both samples was coming from the aluminum diborite and boron oxide phases, right? However, the higher coefficient of uh, uh, friction for the 1200 degrees Celsius is because of the borate phase, right? Now, what happened for this 12, uh, 1500 degrees Celsius uh, uh, sintering sample, like sample sintered at 1500 degrees Celsius, those borate phase were uh, decomposed and another phase was formed, which was boron oxide and boron oxide is also low coefficient, uh, coefficient of, uh, phase and that contributed further to reduce the coefficient of friction. Remember, when uh, if you, if you uh, recall the coefficient of friction curve for 1500 degrees, uh, the sample sintered at 1500 degrees Celsius, that the moment the surface degradation happened, the coefficient of friction reduced. What does that mean? That means the decomposed bore, uh, uh, bored phases into the boron oxide phase was revealed or it came on the surface right and that contributed to lower the coefficient of friction further is that is that clear is yes, that sir, what yes, you sir. were looking for? okay yes sir uh, yeah, yeah so uh, there is one another question uh, what is the criteria uh, that that was selected for the test condition uh, say uh, i think the participant is talking about that ball and disc uh, experiment i think or we, or we, are, we, are, we, are ah, we are testing. Oh, you mean the pinon disc testing, right? Ah, pinon disc, yeah. I, yes, yeah, I, I think, think uh, that uh, one Newton load is selected. No? One Newton load right, and right, some right. Uh, velocity. Yeah. When, yeah. You, when you look at when you look at the uh, theory of uh, a coefficient of friction, right? So it's a coefficient of friction, right? So what happens is uh, uh, it is F divided by P, right? It's a frictional force divided by applied load, right? Doesn't matter what applied load you use, right? You use minimum or maximum, your coefficient of friction is going to be the same, right? So you can you can choose whatever the, uh, see, for example, if you wanted to study the wear behavior of the samples, right? What I would do is I would use little aggressive condition so that I wanted the surface to be damaged, right? But that is not going to affect my coefficient of friction, right? Whatever the coefficient of friction is the property of uh, frictional uh, force and the applied load. But here our target was to study the wear mechanisms of the sample as well. So our target is to damage the surface so that we can study what are the mechanisms by which those surfaces were damaged. Right. So accordingly, we, we can design our experiments. Okay, sir. Yes. Uh, yes, from participants. Uh, yes, uh, there is one another question, sir. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes, which recent material uh, that you are going to suggest for heavily loaded, low speed journal bearing? I'll Yes. What, what is the recent material if you ah, suggest? Suggest for heavily loaded, low speed journal bearing with high load. Oh, low speed. 
Okay. Well, I mean, there are, there are a lot of uh, uh, materials available, uh, but uh, it might be difficult to answer based, based on uh, your uh, application criteria, right? Because, uh, well, I would rather look for the, uh, you know, system rather than just the material. So, sir, this is what are the applications we're talking about? It's, it's a low speed. Sir, this is specifically uh, low speed journal bearing means sugar mill roller bearing. That. So this is. Sugar mill bearing. Well, it's, yeah. So again, that's what I was, that's that is what I was asking about. What are the applications? For example, if we if we are talking about uh, sugar mill uh, journal uh, bearing, that the application conditions are very different, right? The the conditions. Uh, uh, Dr. Kakade also did some research, and uh, I think his uh, PhD was uh, uh, in that area. That uh, the tribochemistry plays a very important role in the surface damage, right? So even if we if we talk about the coefficient of friction wear mechanism, we also need to consider the tribochemistry of those materials as well. Like uh, if we uh, talk about the sugar mill, right? This uh, the, the the crusher uh, mill. There, the service conditions are very aggressive, right? So it it, it might be very difficult to answer uh, right away the question. So if we look at all the scenario, application conditions and all, we might be able to come up with uh, you know uh, sort of answers. But here, uh, if you think about the app in terms of the application, right? Uh, the most important thing is that the failure of uh, that particular shaft. Sometimes we may be able to uh, sacrifice on co a coefficient of friction, you know, just to prolong the life of uh, the shaft, right? Because uh, it is not affordable to shut down the uh, mill, you know, because of the failure of those uh, uh, shafts. Because because of the downtime, there's a huge uh, cost involved in it, right? Because the sugar mill is only seasonal uh, uh, industry, and on the top of that, if uh, uh, mill down that contributes to the uh, loss of the uh, sugar industry, is it right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are sir? Hello. Hi. Ah, yes, I'm audible, sir. Ah, yes, I can hear you. Ah, yes, sir. There is one another question. Can we use aluminum alloy? Uh, that is a A356 series reinforced with silicon carbide and graphite, especially for high temperature application like piston. Yeah, well, now for, uh, this is aluminum alloys, right? Uh, so when we talk about aluminum alloy, the aluminum alloy has their own limitations for high temperature applications, right? So the coefficient of friction and uh, uh, might be performed uh, or provided by the graphite. But however, I can make a comment on uh, uh, high temperature uh, performance of graphite is not very good. So you can think about actually uh, aluminum alloy and graphite composite ha do not have a very good uh, high temperature performance, uh, primarily because of the graphite performance. So what happens is basically Graphite and aluminum, <laughs> it's kind of form like a mud at high temperature, and that really degrades the interface. If if you uh, would like to uh, select aluminum alloys and uh, any other uh, re reinforcement, I would rather consider uh, other element. Uh, yeah, silicon carbide is okay. We can also use sapphires, or there are a lot of studies uh, been conducted. Uh, using the rare earth elements as well. Rare earth element also increases the high temperature performance of the materials. But graphite might not be a good option. Be just because of its performance, high temperature performance is not good. Yes, sir. Sir, there is a, one another question. Uh, suggest material for nano satellite structure. <laughs> that that might be a very specific uh, question, right? 
because we might, may not be able to just answer uh, this nano set because there are a lot of other uh, design parameters will be involved right so nano satellite when we uh, call it, is it really nanoscale level, or uh, we are just naming naming the satellite as a nano satellite, right? So it might be a little bit difficult to answer that question. But you know, uh, you have my email address. You might have mentioned from the slide. You can contact me, and we can give me a little further details. I will be happy to uh, help you. Uh, yes. Yes, I think, yeah, uh, I think all the questions. Nano, when we when we say nano satellite structure, that is very limited information, right? So when we do the selection of material, we need the entire spectrum, right? All the all, all the conditions and uh, service uh, all the service conditions and other uh, parameters, right? Available. So it might be very difficult to answer, uh, you know, uh, straight away. Yes, sir. I'll definitely I'll uh, share your email ID in chat box. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I sure. think yeah. I think I'll, I'll already. I think almost all questions are covered. Still, from participants, yes, anybody is interested to ask uh, uh, you about uh, your queries, so you can unmute yourself. Or yes. I think there is there are no questions, sir. So I request all the participants. Uh, feedback link is shared in chat box. So I'll, I request all the participants to fill that feedback form also. Yes, sir. Pawar, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mughal sir is going to deliver the uh, present work of time. So please request him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. Thank, thanks a lot, sir. Ingoli, sir. Mughal. Oh, thank yes, you very I, much. I, I have I'm honored. Yes. yes, I would like to request uh, Dr. S.P. Mughal. Uh, to give a uh, vote of thanks for her session. Thank you, sir. On the behalf of Department of Mechanical Engineering of M.E. Samajas, KBT College of Engineering, Nasik, I take this opportunity to thank our today's speaker, Dr. Sudip Ingole, sir, for sharing his experience of research in development of self-lubricating materials Though the time in USA, it is midnight 1 a.m., still, sir, has given his valuable time for us. Thank you, sir. I thank to management of MAB Samaj, our principal and education officer, Dr. N.S. Patil, sir, vice principal, Professor N.B. Desle, sir, our head of department, Dr. V.C. Shewali, sir, for their valuable guidance and support. I thank to Professor Diri Kulkarni for technical support during session. Last but not least, I thank to all participants present for this session. Thank you. Over to you, Power Sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, so with this, um, yes, uh, we, I declare that this first session is over. It is concluded. This with the permission of a uh, respected guest. Hello. Hello, I have questions, sir. Hello. Someone has any question, query. Yeah, that's fine. You, you can you can ask. Uh, yes, sir, uh, myself, uh, Subhash, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Can you? Yes, sir. Uh, so I want to ask a question about uh, uh, MQL method. Uh, can we use uh, for uh, composite? Uh, Hello. Can, can you repeat your question? Uh, yep, yeah. MQL method, sir. MQL means uh, minimum uh, quantity lubrication method. Uh, can we use uh, for a composite? For like a turning machine, like a milling machine, drilling machine operations? Yeah, you should be able to, right? What What is the limitation? So we, we sh you should be able to use it. Hello. Yeah, well, I think that is that is the target, right? We we would like to use minimum uh, lubrication. Hello, sir. Hello. Ah, Subhash, yeah, sir. Hello. Have you got your answer, sir? Hello. Yeah, yeah. You can send me an email. So we can we can discuss further, right? Okay, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So I will, I will be glad to give you information on. Okay, okay. Thank yes, you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Not a problem, okay? Yeah, sure, sure. Your email ID is posted in chat box, sir. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. You, you can, can you can uh, whoever want to. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think. Okay, I sir. Thank, thanks a lot, sir. Kakar, yeah. sir. Yeah, yes. I'm going to put. Thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Ingole, sir. Hello, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I'm glad to uh, be part of this uh, workshop. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you, sir, for your uh, sharing you, your valuable experience. Thank you very much, sir. Once yes, again. sir. Actually, we are we are meet, we are meeting you for second time, sir. Last time uh, before, uh, I think four five years back. Yeah. Oh so yeah, you, I visited you in person. Well, I believe. Yes, 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 sir, yes, sir. 